Well, here he is, the one and only Dr. Cliff Huddis. Uh, big fan, Cliff, of you and what you have done over the years. Really appreciate it. And I, I don't think we can ask uh, of a better leader for uh, our society than you. So thank you for coming on Healthcare Unfiltered. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. I don't know about the one, but I do think you're onto something with the only. I'm pretty confident <laughs> that I am the only Clifford Huddis on earth. So anybody calls you Clifford or just Cliff? My mother, when she's not happy. <laughs> and usually when she's not happy, Clifford. <laughs> you know, um, I, I got to ask you, like, how, how did this come about? Uh, I mean, obviously, we all know you're a breast medical oncologist. You, you've done amazing um, work in breast oncology. How did this, uh, how did you transition into uh, mostly non-clinical work? I know that you still see patients and things like that, but uh, how did this come about? Well, that's a, a profound question, and there is no short answer. So you may have to edit after this in post. I know we like long answers here. Um, if I really think back to the beginning uh, of my own career, on the one hand, I loved and still love seeing and taking care of patients. And that's why I still do it very minimally as an unpaid volunteer. I like the interaction with patients. At the same time, early on, I had a vague understanding of the critical importance of public policy and the therefore obligation we as physicians have to maintain an active voice in that process. But I honestly had no personal experience with this or even clear idea about where and how. Um, we could, if you want, talk about my career where I was just very fortunate to be several times in the right place at the right time um, to, to catch important advances and take a small part in making them into clinical reality. But a critical thing that happened to me was that in the last 10 years of my research career, I was introduced to an investigator who was working on the problem of obesity and inflammation. And... Um, very quickly, if you're a scientist and a translational researcher, that was opening up the possibilities of targeted therapies that might even be applied to the general public. And frankly, you're seeing that play out right now uh, in, in modern times with the use of uh, the, the latest class of anti-obesity uh, drugs. But I was always struck by the fact that the root cause of this problem wasn't really the pathway that we were interrupting, but rather ultimately um, agricultural and economic policy in the US. And what I mean is uh, there are a series of policies in the US that directly make it less expensive to produce certain kinds of high calorie foods. And therefore we have the well-reported, widely recognized uh, obesity epidemic in the U.S. And it is not limited, of course, to the U.S. It's seen throughout the West, and it's the fastest growing problem even globally. And the connection, of course, to cancer is um, important, although arguably not the single most important aspect of obesity. Obviously, you've got heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, and so on, all kinds of consequences that should be motivating to the public. But this is a long wind up to the fact that uh, I began to wonder about the role of changing public policy as the approach to this rather than medicating hundreds of millions of people in the end to deal with the consequences. Needless to say, that's a long path and it may be a dead end and it's not really where I work now, but it's an example of the reality of the problem. As I advanced in my volunteer leadership opportunities and career at ASCO, I had several specific opportunities to serve on ASCO's government relations team. We can talk a little bit more about this, but it actually um, was a turning point in my life because what I saw in that role was that persistence, patience, and clarity along with coordination and collaboration actually can move the needle on Capitol Hill. And I know that there's a lot of cynicism, especially again today. Uh, trust in, in, in leaders is perhaps at a low point right now. Um, but over the years, when we had a consistent um, message, when it was 
uh, supported by others in the, for example, um, biomedical field, um, we began to, to affect some policy changes. And we can talk about those maybe a little later, but my cynicism was actually reduced. And so this gets to the finish line for me, which was that one of the many motivations I had to take this uh, big step in my career uh, was the possibility that I could have a small part in affecting important and meaningful change for our members and through them, therefore impacting the quality of cancer care. That's really the, the hope. Now, there are a lot of facets. There's a lot of other parts of that we could unpack, but that's my no, that's um, that, that that that's amazing, and um, I I totally relate to the importance of um, what you could do to help patients beyond um, just prescribing the medicine. The interaction is something that you'll never be able to replace. But you know, healthcare delivery, the the work with payers, so many things affect patient care beyond just you know um, the exam room. So how how long you've assumed that post, uh, uh, Cliff? So I was uh, elected to the board, if I remember correctly, in 2008 or nine, I think it was eight. Um, I should check, I should know this. Um, <laughs> and I served a three-year term um, and I was fortunate to be elected into the seat as treasurer. And I mentioned that because um, that gave me the opportunity to work directly with our then CFO at ASCO uh, and learn a little bit about the management and financial responsibilities of running um, what amounts to a, a mid-sized corporation. Um, I was then elected to the board as the president serving, uh, again, a three-year term, but the 2013-14 year that I was actually president was the 50th anniversary of uh, ASCO. So that was a just a fun coincidence for me. And so the point is that I spent, a, I must, I don't know if I gave the math right, but I spent six years essentially continuously serving on, on the board. Um, and I just developed a greater and greater respect for and affinity for the staff and the work at ASCO. Uh, my predecessor, Alan Lichter, um, was very disciplined about many aspects of ASCO's uh, management and leadership. And one of the things that he pointed out was that healthy organizations are able to withstand regular change in at the top of the leadership. And that um, it's not only good for the organization, but it's actually good for the leader. And therefore he was pretty adamant that he was going to serve 10 years and then with lots of pre-planning move on. And uh, at one point, um, and he probably did this with other people as well, but he put his arm around me and suggested that I might consider this role as CEO, make that step out of academic and clinical full-time medicine into this administrative role um, because of the exciting opportunities that it offers and the chance to make a different kind of difference. Um, I want to just interject here. In the years since I did this, which was 2016, of course, I've learned a ton. I was um, not in business before. Uh, I actually hired an executive coach right at the beginning and, and uh, worked closely with that coach for the first few years that I was in the role to make sure that I was um, testing my ideas and bouncing them off of somebody who was experienced and um, dispassionate, if you will, about the specific organization, able to see things with a lack of bias. Um, but recently, and I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself here, but it's been on my mind, I... I um, read this book this summer called Strength. I think it's called Strength to Strength or From Strength to Strength. It's by Arthur Brooks. And I have it on my phone. I've been recommending it to many of my um, board members and others who ask about career advice. But the point is uh, that the book is about recognizing essentially where you are on your career arc and what you might do next that represents a new arc to step onto. Um, and it's very specifically addressed to people who, uh, like us, have been objectively successful, looking for challenges, um, but also recognize where they are in their career arc. And in this regard, I also have to point out that my lifelong mentor, Larry Norton, always in talking to me would emphasize the importance of understanding your age, 
normal career pathways, what's ahead and what is appropriate. And all of that for me came together in my mid to late 50s with uh, when this opportunity presented itself. To me, it represented a step onto a new career arc, a chance to not be plateaued, but rather be challenging myself and rising to a new plateau. That's that's fascinating. I actually I'm gonna I'm gonna look at that book, uh, Arthur Brooks. Um, yeah, he was a uh, former CEO of the American Enterprise Institute, and his own career and and biography is revealed a bit in the book. And it, he talks about recognizing his own successes and the limits of the success and the limits of his own growth in roles and what led him, therefore, to make several bold choices in his own. Uh, career you know, i could uh, i could tell the level of eq that you have is is something i don't really encounter very often you are so aware of where you are where you may be heading and where you were and and honestly this is not something that a lot of leaders have one of the things and, and i appreciate the fact you said you hired an executive coach because you you noticed maybe there's an opportunity to improve on your own attributes because i've always felt in academic medicine you know, you assume positions in leadership because you've been there for a long time. Like a lot of times, it's not very uncommon. You've been in the division for like 20 years. You become the next division chief, the chair of medicine, the chair of surgery. And it's not always, you could be a very successful academician, a researcher and have 300 papers, but you may not be the best quote unquote leader in, because there's certain attributes. You could be, but you may not be. And I've always felt that in academic medicine, the selection of leaders um, it always relies a lot of an academic accomplishments and very not always looks at certain leadership qualities that you really need to take that to the next step. I don't know if you noticed the same, but I've always felt that this is an opportunity for academic medicine to change some of the criteria in selecting their leaders. Well, frankly, um, you put your finger on something that we hold near and dear at ASCO before I was there starting really again around 2000, I think it's, is that right? 2000, I don't, I won't say the year because I'm, I don't think I'm quite right, but fundamentally um, in medicine, especially my era, um, we really did not get any formal teaching in business administration, management and leadership as we went through medical school. And to your point, I do think the impression has often been that People rose in the ranks at academic centers and even beyond based upon certain quantifiable accomplishments like first authored papers, grants received, grant funding, all of that. And um, I, I do think, though, that to some degree, a degree of natural inborn leadership skills emerged and people who were able to rally people behind them and are disproportionately promoted. I do think that that it's not all blind to that. But to your point, there was a huge opportunity to offer our community more formal leadership skills via programs. And our leadership development program, which is one of our um, uh, most, uh, I think, respected programs, uh, it was born out of that very need, graduating 12 to 16 um, participants per year with a goal of giving them the skills they need to do just what you said, which is rise within their institutions and rise uh, within broader national, international organizations, possessing specific skills uh, that, that would enable them. I only wish I had had the opportunity to benefit from some of that kind of training. I probably could have avoided any number of mistakes. No, 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 no. These mistakes are important, provided they actually did occur. You're being very humble and, and, and modest, but... Um... In all seriousness, I really think, you know, when the time is right, whether it is while you are the CEO or post uh, you step down from your post, there is really an opportunity to to write something. I mean, as I'm not going to that's not dismissive. You have to think about writing a book because I do think you bring both things. It's not there's element of it, which is a personal story, but I think you're bringing certain things that. I'm sure there are certain things you were surprised with that they pissed you off and certain things you were pleasantly surprised with. So there is a book in you, Cliff. Maybe. So I, I have to admit that the thought has long crossed my mind, but I'm just going to share this humbling anecdote with you. Um, when we hit the COVID crisis um, in March of 2020, right, 
I um I remember that we Asco, without getting into too much detail, has been a rel relatively uh, enlightened workplace. I inherited what's called a, a ROW, R-O-W-E. It's a results-oriented work environment. It used to be called results-only work environment. And this is a model for running uh, corporations that um, consultants uh, advised Asco to consider years ago and was in place when I got there. Oversimplifying it, it really, in spirit, makes each employee their own CEO responsible for their own output. And it eliminates narrowly defining work productivity by how many hours you spend in the office or in a seat. It gives each person uh, who works at ASCO within reasonable limits, the freedom to do what they need. And everybody, by the way, always immediately goes to, well, I don't understand if somebody has to be staffing the front door, how do they do that remotely or on their own clock? And the answer is they can, of course. But many, many other people can work on documents or intellectual content or even collaborations, whatever it is, from three in the afternoon till midnight and hand it off to somebody who works on it the next day or whatever, as long as the work gets done, fine. So why am I sharing all of this with you? Um, we hit COVID and of course, America went into a revolution at that point with suddenly imposed remote work for everybody. Frankly, the transition was flipping a switch for us in that way. However, like everybody else, I was deeply concerned with two things at the time. The first was transmission of accurate information about what was going on and what we were doing as an organization. Remember, we have more than 500 staff. We're, it's a meaningful um, communications challenge to keep everybody aligned. And the second issue was culture. How do you maintain the culture? One of the things that gives me great joy, of course, is when I hear from volunteers about how much they respect and appreciate the staff support they get when they interact with ASCO. And the question, again, repeating myself is, how do you maintain that if you're an all virtual office, all remote? So I began writing a blog internally, not for general use, but in fact, to communicate out to the staff, I've gotten the habit of opening every week, Monday morning, with a short blog. And you could imagine if you went back and looked at it, that in March and April and May of 2020, it was really crisis directed. What do the numbers look like? What are the death rates? How are we going to convert to an entirely uh, virtual meeting instead of um, in person? How do committees meet? How do we maintain productivity and so forth? But my goal, like I say, really was to maintain the culture. So I, of course, now have kept up this habit. I write a a short piece every weekend. It's not particularly um, well written. It isn't necessarily grammatical. I just bang it out on you know Friday or Saturday or Sunday, whatever's on my mind. This week, I wrote about my experience on Saturday visiting with the Win uh, Scholars, which is a, a diversity training program, and thinking about where that goes in the future. I'm proud of our ability to play a small role in supporting it through Conquer Cancer. But at any rate. I thought, gee, this would make a nice collection and I probably could find themes in there, make a book. And uh, without naming names, um, a, a well-known writer in our community, when I ran this by him, he said, yeah, no, don't do that. You're not a very good writer. No, 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 no. I disagree. <laughs> I disagree with the... But you didn't read it, so don't be so No, no, quick. no, no. But I think, I mean, I recall, I mean, I wrote a book and there's a new book actually coming up uh, next year as well on, on cancer in general that I wrote. Mm -hmm. And it all starts like this. I mean, I, you know, the, the first version is never the best version, like writing a paper. But um, I think the challenge, at least that I face is, you know, when you write scientific paper, you know, your audience and when you write a book to the general public, you have to realize that the audience is not really a board certified uh, oncologist. But I also want to put a plug in for the ASCO staff. I agree. I served on the Healthcare Disparities Committee for three years at ASCO as a volunteer, and it was really a pleasurable experience. I'll, I'll look forward to serving on more committees, but it's really, um, they're, they're, they're uh, very attuned to what's going on, and they're very helpful. But yeah, this but, is where I, I always have to put in the plug that there's a firewall. I don't do any of the committee assignments. I have no bearing on which volunteers get picked. That's what your colleagues who are elected do. Yes, yes, absolutely. But, you know, I mean, you mentioned the COVID thing. And I mean, in your role as obviously, you know, the chief executive officer of, I believe, I, I don't have the numbers, but I presume ASCO is the largest 
clinical oncology society in the world. I think I, I have no idea whether we have more members than ESMO, for example, or other societies, but it's probably up there. You do deal with crises, and you mentioned COVID is, is one of them. Um, obviously, we had to deal with drug shortages, um, you know, uh, recently as well. And, and you have, in your role, you must react. Certain things you anticipate and certain things you don't. Uh, but it's not something that you can say, well, I'm going to obviously, you know, table this. Um, and one of the things that obviously occurred, uh, you know, as, as you know, and uh, is, you know, this uh, ABIM recertification process and, and the MOC. And, and, you know, it all started in the summer where a petition was, uh, you know, uh, proposed by, um, uh, by Dr. Aaron Goodman uh, to end the MOC and all of these things. So, so this is an, an example of things that, uh, you know, I mean, you did not anticipate COVID, but you had to deal with it. You did not, uh, maybe you, we could sometimes anticipate drug shortages, but in a sense, you still had to deal with it. Uh, and then, you know, this is another example. A as the CEO, um, when, when something happens in the clinical oncology ecosystem, um, how do you decide whether, A, this is a problem, okay, I don't really need to deal with it, for example, because there's uh, if you're going to deal with every problem every day, uh, there's always something, versus a problem of a significance where this is something that ASCO must react to or you know must address. We cannot really ignore it. This is a great and timely question. Um, and let me start by dropping a couple of uh, pins in this and we'll maybe come back to them. One, the ABIM issue is not new either, just like the drug shortages one. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. But before I get to the specifics, I actually want to talk about the general this issue, which is related even to our earlier discussion already. One of the things that struck me as we dealt with crisis after crisis, and I'll give you a list, gun control, immigration, uh, reproductive rights, um, uh, structural racism, each one of these issues gets brought up and there can be um, a vocal group of people. It's hard to judge, minority, majority. A concern I have always had is, again, for a healthy organization, it shouldn't really matter who's sitting in the CEO seat, whether we respond or not. There's some issues I'm passionate about. There's some issues I'm biased about. There are some issues that don't concern me. That should never really drive what a, an organization representing nearly 50,000 global members does. So that raises the immediate question, how do you establish a structure so that you can avoid hypocrisy and be consistent and useful in your responses? And there are frameworks out there. Uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Sally Sussman, has a book right now called Breaking Through. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, mm -hmm. It was uh, her description, both of her personal life and her role uh, at Pfizer as the mRNA vaccine was being developed and, and deployed. But really what it was about was using crises to organize um, or to help organizations rather um, hone their message and make a positive impact. Um, and she has a short checklist in there that essentially is a when and where and how do you act in response checklist. I was heartened to see that because um, we have our own and we've had them over the years informally, but the last few years on multiple occasions, I've asked the ASCO board of directors to uh, review and endorse specific frameworks. When and how do we respond to domestic policy issues? When and how do we engage by filing a brief uh, with the Supreme Court, an amicus brief? When and how do we engage on uh, international crises and so forth? So the answer to your question is we actually have a formal process. And I don't have the checklist in front of me right now, but it boils down to essentially um, how is this impacting oncology? Will our voice matter? Um, do we have resources that can make a difference? Are others engaged? Um, and so on. And, and there are many other criteria. So that's the framework that we use. The second thing I'll say is, um, as I came into this role as CEO, one of the um, disciplines that I felt we needed was clarity around strategic plan and goals. 
And in formulating our first modern five-year strategic plan, we were forced rightly to declare our core values. If you visit the ASCO headquarters, you'll see them in all the glass dividers. I don't remember noticing, but they're always written every three words. What are they? Evidence, care, and impact. Those are our core values. And each one of them, of course, expands into something. But with regard now to the MOC question, um, I'll start with the summer. Yes, the crisis or kerfuffle rather, uh, which I think is a better <laughs> word for it, uh, that emerged this summer. First of all, I think it represented long simmering concerns. It didn't suddenly pop up this summer at all. The, the complaining and griping and recognition of issues, that's been there for a while. But the first question that we had, and I think you and I spoke about this at one point earlier, was the evidence question. Yes, at that time, there was a group of people um, expressing real displeasure on social media. But the immediate question for me was, what is the quantifiable evidence of unhappiness or desire for change and so forth? And so as we talk about this, I'll explain what we did. But our initial reaction was to essentially gather the facts, figure out really what was going on here. Um, and uh, like I said, we, I don't want to go off in the wrong direction for you yet. I'll see what you want to talk about. But, but actually, I, I appreciate, the uh, but I appreciate yeah. that because I do think, I do think what you're what you're conveying to listeners is that you want to approach this methodically, as opposed to emotionally, right? I mean, I think you know, and I think that is that is frankly the appropriate way a leader would do this, right? I mean, you're not gonna. You know, it's not an emotional thing. Like, okay, I see something. Let me apply methodology into it to understand it better. And this starts to get at what I want to talk about. We have a history of, we think, working productively for positive change with the ABIM. And assuming that the initial concerns were legitimate, um, I was very motivated to make sure that when we spoke out, it would be constructively and ideally helping move the community collaboratively to a better future. In other words, I don't wanna just throw rocks and break glass. I actually wanna build something better. And we have a history of doing that effectively with ABIM, which I think is important to maintain. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, um, you know, the, the approach that at least we understood is that ASCO wanted to quantify the, the exactly. quote unquote, the level of unhappiness and, and, um, and, and we'll get into this in a little bit, because I believe that's where you started the survey that was actually. Uh, exactly. But, but let me just say, you know, quantifying the level of unhappiness is not an end. It's just in a sense, a gating question about the motivation to act. The truth is, even if everybody was happy, there still might be really important improvements that we could make in the yeah. process. And that gets me to my point, which is no matter what we do, if we're going to spend time and effort, I want to be helping deliver something that's better than the current situation. I think that the one thing, though, that that it's it's noteworthy is that Social media is social media, and there are thousands of people who are not on social media. And I think that um, even although we will go over the survey that you sent and, and next steps, but but we'll always have to recognize that uh, it's like almost sometimes hospital surveys. Uh, you know, you don't get a lot of answers to it. I mean, you, you it gets sent, and the response is three five percent. So I'm curious as we go over the survey whether you've seen the percent of response uh, more than other surveys ask or sent. But, but before we, we get there, I think the, the first issue that I always hear is that this is a problem that should not be a problem. In other words, it's a problem created by the ABIM since 1990 uh, to do these tests every 10 years or laundry knowledge assessment. But you know, we we have licenses, we have CMEs. We, you know, I have actually almost 120 CME hours every every year, and I'm um, I'm licensed actually in five states, as an example. So, so um, the first question to you, Cliff, is that a problem? Like, why? Like, why couldn't we go back to before 1990, where there was a lifelong certification? 
I, first of all, I think that's a great question. And I have to then, it's almost like a conflict of interest disclosure, point out that I am board certified in internal medicine from 1986, if my memory serves. And that's that's lifelong without theoretically any need for renewal. Right. Well, on the other hand, I had the misfortune because I delayed starting my medical oncology training to sitting for the very first time-limited medical oncology <laughs> service, which was 1991. If I'd been just a touch smarter uh, in those years, I would have skipped the, the gap year, gone right into med -onc, and I would have ended up with a lifelong certificate as well. So. Yeah, like it's hard to believe like with everything you have done, right? I mean, I think there are folks probably on this podcast that are listening they can just look at your accomplishments in, in medical oncology. It is hard to believe that your certification is contingent on random tests in general or 30 questions get sent to you every quarter. Right. You know, the reality is you've taken care of thousands of people with breast cancer. So that, that's where the disconnect that constituents have. I agree, but I, I am, um, I try to be open-minded and fair about this on always. And um, I will say that um, the rise of certification in general and then of maintenance of certification um, comes from a fundamentally well-meaning place. There is a concern that number one, when patients walk into a physician's office, they should have some way of knowing that that physician is practicing at above some, at least minimum standard of care um, that, that any reasonable person would expect. And in this regard, you know, you stretch yourself back almost to the beginning of the 20th century and into the 19th century in the United States. And of course there were no standards and even some training was apprenticeship rather than formal uh, medical school training. So we, we have to recognize that the roots of this were fundamentally in a desire to protect the public from unscrupulous practitioners. Um, that's not to say that we're on the right path now or that we haven't gone too far, but I, I do think it's important to understand that there was a well-meaning motivation to all this. The second thing is um, that especially now with the rapid expansion in um, medical knowledge and the need for people to be keeping up all the time, there was again, in order to maintain professionalism, there was a desire to make sure that the individuals were meeting some standard, not just based on sitting in a seat or attesting um, that they had attended a lecture or something, but rather that they could demonstrate knowledge. And the last thing I want to say here is uh, I have come to understand that at least from the leadership of ABIM, they view their role at times um, somewhat narrowly as providing that reassurance to the public. In other words, they will say sometimes, and if I'm misquoting them, I, I will retract this because I don't want to speak for anybody but myself, but they um, can say at times that their role is in fact the objective testing and therefore not necessarily the learning and education. Now that's going to be at odds with some of what we're about to talk about, I think. Yeah, but we'll get, we'll get, we're, yeah, we'll get yeah. back to that. I yeah, mean, but it explains think... that the issue here is that um, there is some data, and uh, I have seen it, and and probably others have too, that does suggest that with time, some people can become paradoxically more competent and less knowledgeable, and so there is a role for some sort of not just lifelong learning, which we are all committed to, but some way to demonstrate that. I mean, yeah, and I think that, that's the issue here. The, yeah, the question no, no. then becomes one of tactics. Is the current structure the right one? And I think right. there's a lot of room for discussion there. Yeah. And I think, you know, we'll get into this because some folks would say, you know, I mean, you know, you're, you're licensed. There's a way for hospital privileges. Your, your colleagues will say if you're doing bad care, things like that. But 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 we'll get to it. But let's start with the, you decided to send a survey. How did you, I guess, before we go into the results and the percent of folks who responded, how did you come up with, was it with the questions? Uh, um, you know, I mean, the, it actually was very fast. Five, six questions took like one to two minutes to respond. So obviously 
um, um, was there a difficult process to get the survey done through the board and things like that? And, and then we'll go into the percent of folks who responded to the survey compared to other surveys ASCO uh, answered, and we'll go over the results. So a couple of things. Number one, we're really lucky at ASCO that uh, Rich Shilsky, when he was our chief medical officer, had the foresight to create our Center for um, Research and Analysis, or CENTRA. Mm. And uh, Liz Garrett Mayer is now the the uh, um, VP who runs that that center, and they report up to our chief medical officer Julie Graylo, who I'm, I know many people mm -hmm. know. And the reason I mention that is that we already have at ASCO a formal scientific survey process. Many members have taken advantage of it to survey our members on various questions, and members can opt in or out for this. So we have this experience. Um, uh, building surveys and uh, designing them in a rigorous way to get useful answers in a range of questions. So we went to that group. Uh, we, uh, at the same time, stood up um, a little task force off of the board of directors with some outside participants to help us frame what kinds of questions we wanted to ask. And we had a pretty good idea that this would be a multi-step process. Indeed, as you point out, this questionnaire, the survey rather, was designed to be done in a matter of a few minutes. It was designed to be done on a smartphone. It also was designed to protect identities. Um, at the same time, there's a technical issue, which we needed to make sure each person who did it could only do it once. So there's- hey, I'm from Chicago. I wanted to do it more than once. That's it right. Didn't, early didn't work. It didn't work. Yeah, yeah. It didn't work. Exactly. Right. So we, we accomplished all that. And it was a series of questions that I don't have in front of me, but they really relate to basically satisfaction with certification, both initial and ongoing, and the beginning of some solicitation of input about what could possibly be better. I say beginning because we always plan to take the results and then drill down in uh, more formal focus groups and then run a second broader survey uh, before going out to, to, to what we think is the final step here, which we'll get to, but I'll hint that that involves dealing directly on behalf of our members with the ABIM. Did and that brings, the, I'll just say one more thing. This is all about both understanding the problem, but even more importantly, proposing a better future. Did you tell the ABIM you're going to be sending a survey? I mean, I'm sure absolutely, they saw it. Absolutely told them. Because the last thing we would ever want to do, especially, and, and let me just put in a plug here for collaboration. Um, we have been um, earnest, and happy collaborators with the IBM, ABIM from 2013, basically. And maybe it's worth reviewing this a little bit because people probably don't uh, realize this, but back in 2013, and this is why early in the discussion, I said, this is not actually a new problem. Back in 2013, the ABIM commissioned what they called Assessment 2020 Task Force. Uh, and they're Quest was to develop a vision for the future of ongoing assessment in internal medicine and in associated subspecialties. They released that report looking forward to 2020 in 2015, and they had three major suggestions back then already. So this goes back, I'm just reminding everybody there's a track record here. They already were calling for replacement of the 10-year MOC exam with something that would be more meaningful and less burdensome. So... We were already engaged in that. A focus on cognition and technical skills, exactly what you were alluding to, that would assure the public that physicians are staying current with clinical knowledge relevant to patient care. And, and again, we've seen some of that in the LKA, I would say. And then recognizing specialization, that's where the idea came from, that if you maintained your specialty boards, let's say in um, medical oncology, you didn't have to directly maintain them in internal medicine, the parent as long as you maintain the specialization. So this is a reminder that this issue has been out there. And we responded in 2016, ASCO convened what we called an MOC task force. It included both um, academic clinicians and investigators, as well as uh, community or private practice oncologists, because their voice is, is important here. Our impression, by the way, has been that the latter group has been somewhat less concerned with this than the former. But um, that I have to admit is uh, is changing now. I think in in the latest uh, 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 uproar, this task force developed a new model 
and it sought uh, feedback from members a number of times during its work. That's the model we always use. That's what we're using uh, right now. And we proposed a less burdensome online format for exams that could be taken at home or from the office or at a live test center, uh, a shorter exam that was two 90 minute sessions with 45 questions each, allowance to basically not pass it, but take it again without jeopardizing your certification um, and uh, the development uh, of specialized exams. And you'll recall that we were on a pathway to this. I took that exam in, in March of 2020, at the beginning of COVID actually. Um, what happened was in uh, May of 18, we and ABIM announced this collaboration um, publicly and work, we work collaboratively to develop these first exams. The first of this shorter low stakes exam um, was presented in 2020 and it was general oncology breast, which is the one I obviously took and heme malignancy. Lung and GI were next on the tread, uh, next on the, on the pathway for development, but they did not get developed. Fundamentally, the number of uh, multiple choice questions that were required for the exams um, and the relatively number, a small number of test takers for each cycle ultimately made this untenable. I'm describing all of this because that approach might still be viable. And now in an era of AI, chat, GPT, and so forth, maybe we're about to face a future where the economics are different. The questions can be developed. Yeah. Kind I, of approach yeah, and, I, and I'm... And I'm I'm going to bring you some of the concerns that the constituents have. Right, um, but we're not doing that anymore. That was no, no, I know, I know, I know, I know. We're not. But I maybe just want we to go back to that. Yeah, I want to oh. bring some some of these concerns, but I'm going to do that after we get the survey. So, how many okay, folks? Okay, so, so I just wanted to get that in there because my point is we have this history of working collaboratively, and you asked the question: Did we let the ABIM know? The answer is absolutely. The last thing we want to do is surprise somebody with this. So, called them up, said we're going to survey them. We're going to be relatively quiet until we know what they think. And we're then going to come back with proposals potentially to do things differently. That's really where we're right. going to end up. Right. So how many folks responded? So in rough numbers, let me just say, <laughs> this is a good news, bad news thing. It's the highest survey response we've ever gotten. That's great news. It means right. people care. <laughs> right. But it's about 20%. That's actually not bad. I know, but um, I, I don't think what I'm about to say is true, but it is something to keep in mind. Um, if people really weren't going to be bothered to answer the survey, there is the possibility that the issue isn't that important to them. But you don't know if it went to their spam email. You don't know if it Absolutely went. Absolutely right. I mean, there's so many things, right? It's there's the lots highest of survey. Reasons. To fall off, I agree with you. But there's a second issue, just to keep in mind. And I, I want to make sure nothing I say here is misinterpreted or misunderstood. I am not asserting that either of these things are true. I am saying they are issues that we need to be prepared for and understand. But about 80%, if I remember correctly, 77% of the people who take the post-LKA survey from the ABIM have reported to the ABIM that they found the process to be good. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, if you are, you know, it, it depends what the, the, I think there's two issues here. It's the process of, it's like almost, uh, you know, if you are going to a hospital and the process in the hospital of waiting was, was, People were nice, friendly, and all this, but you still had to wait, and you were not happy with the entire thing. Uh, I mean, there's an element of it that you know. Um, for me, when, I took the LKA. I was able to take it uh, on my couch, sitting there. So the process of doing this versus test center was better, but I still didn't feel I needed to do it. That's the thing. I understand, but but the issue is a. People can set up surveys to obviously get the kinds of information they need. And B, we just have to grapple with the reality. Right. No, absolutely. That um, a majority of the people who've gone through that process have told the ABIM that they found it to be okay. So the ask a survey, the few questions, yeah. are you able to share with us maybe what were the results? Yeah, some of them at a high level. Um, and I think they're unsurprising. And before I do, though, I want to say this. I think they do reflect 
the bulk of the 80%. That's my bias. I'm sharing my concerns because I want to be ready for what people who have a different perspective might bring as a criticism. It's and fair. also to, to remind people that surveys always have their limits. So um, I think it is likely that our results reflect the general view. And frankly, beyond that, we're going to act on these results based upon what we've gotten here. So we take them as pretty convincing. Mm -hmm. But I'm also it's not fair. pretending that there couldn't be a different interpretation. And I am, I wish that more people had answered the, the need. No, no, it, it, it is fair. It is the yeah. largest response survey that ASCO has ever received, but none, nonetheless was only 23% of responses. Probably, so let, right. let's go over some of so, those. So just a little more about the methods. I don't have the absolute numbers here, but just to give people general perspective, the survey was limited to US um, members who indicated that they were board certified and gave us permission to contact them in this day and age, as you know, we're not allowed to just randomly ask everybody a question. We have a group of people who've allowed us to contact them by email. So I think the number of potential survey takers was between eight and 9,000, something like that. We got 1,700 responses in total. Again, about 20% of the eligible group. Um, a few top line items. Number one, the majority, although not by a huge amount, 64%, um, agree that initial certification, that first test that we all take to get our first set of uh, board certification contributes to improve patient care by establishing high standards for training and knowledge. Um, what I find interesting before we go on about that is we all did it. Obviously we all passed it. And so looking back, we all say that it's important or useful or productive um, I actually think scientifically, I'm not 100% sure that we would exactly know that, but it just it, it's a reminder that we do s assume or accept some a priori uh, rules about this. And, and so the simple majority of our, of our test takers think that um, initial certification is good. The flip side is more than a third are even questioning initial certification. Yeah, no, it's it's fair. I mean, I I, I I felt I felt it was my answer was that it was yes. I felt, you know, you finish your fellowship and you feel like it's a stamp of approval. But frankly, I mean, to play devil's advocate on myself, I have no evidence uh, that this is true. <laughs> okay. So um, overwhelmingly, our respondents said that the ongoing MOC program does not improve their practice relevant knowledge, nor does it improve the quality of care that they provide. For that, the number rises to three quarters. 75%. Yeah, well, just about, so I'm right, round. Right, right. We're going to publish all of this in, in more formal ways. So I'm, I don't want to front. No, 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 sure. But I mean, yeah, is... so, so that's interesting as well. So, the, so there's clearly among the 20% of respondents, an overwhelming belief that MOC as currently implemented isn't making um, care better. And they also argue that it is not testing things that matter. Yeah. So we Third. can keep going. Uh, you alluded to your CME credits. Um, the Even a larger majority, now we're up to four out of five of the respondents, think that CME alone is enough and that you don't need MOC. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's a little bit on fees. I, this one... I don't know what to say about it because I actually know that the fees are pretty moderate compared to most other specialties right now, but the vast majority think um, that um, the fees are reasonable. In other words, four out of five think they're not reasonable and about three out of five um, think that the time is reasonable. So basically only minority of our members think that both the fees and the time required are reasonable. The questions and the answers framed in a negative way. The majority think it's unreasonable fees and unreasonable amount of time to be plain spoken about this. Um, and so uh, our takeaway is that this these top line results right now um, mirror what we're hearing anecdotally. And I know you're hearing, they mirror what we heard on social media and um, our presidents who go out and visit with the state affiliates and other communities 
tell us that they're hearing the same thing at that level as well. So right now, uh, I am modestly or moderately reassured that the uh, concern is not just real and legitimate, but it probably does reflect the majority view. And coming back to my earlier caution, I am willing to believe that even in the silent major majority here, probably if pressed, the sentiment probably runs similar to what we see here. So this is a call to action. That's the takeaway. Is there a communication cliff between you guys and Ash? I hosted the president of Ash, uh, uh, Bro Dr. Brodsky and Mikhail Sekiris on my podcast, and and Ash actually issued a pretty strong statement. There were no, there was no survey. They issued strong statement, and the ABIM response to Ash was heavily criticized. It was very, quote unquote, dismissive, um, kind of. Um, I presume, you know, again, I don't know if there was some communication between ASCO and ASH regarding this. Uh, and have you shared the results of the survey back with the ABIM or not yet? Not yet on the latter question. On the former question, um, there is a group of the CEOs of all the medical professional societies, several groups, actually. And I am in reasonably close conversation and collaboration with all of them and very specifically um, uh Ash was well aware of our plan for the survey, and I was aware of their plan to, to submit this letter. I think their correspondence helps. It raises issues, and it lets us see where the ABM stands. I'm hoping that our approach also ends up helping, but we are clearly choosing not to play this out through public debate, but rather um, to, to engage constructively, if we can, in building a better future well state. One of the things I hear constantly on social media is, is two things, and, and I wonder what your response to it. One is a lot of folks are saying the only way to make ASCO hear our pain is just to stop paying the dues. And you know what? I don't need to pay five, six, seven hundred dollars a year. And I'm, you know, feeling economic pressure uh, might lead to action. And I actually I'm hearing this um, more often than than I expected. I'm a proud member of ASCO and, and of ASH, and but you know I think a lot of people are feeling that maybe if we stop paying the dues uh, and they see a decline in revenue, that might actually uh, let them to to hear us out. That's number one, and number two, which is I think a little bit more important. Like I kind of feel we live in an era where I don't need to remember a lot of things. Like I mean, honestly, like my, my I have two kids in uh, in high school. I mean, you know, the way they even learning in high school is very different than what I used to learn. Like, you know, they can go on the internet, they can find something. And I felt when I did the LKA, I'm enrolled in the LKA, I felt sometimes I'm in a race on Google and up to date to find the answer in things I'm not comfortable with. I can tell you, I'm very uncomfortable with Bon Wilbrand's disease management. I'm board certified in him. Yeah. But I have no idea how to treat Von Wilbrand's disease. So before I sit on the LK, I have the Von Wilbrand's algorithm on, on, on Google. I have it literally up to date because I know I'm going to get two questions and I need to find the answers to it. That can't be like, this does not going to make me a better doctor. Uh, it just seems a little bit not attuned to the changes in how we are consuming information. Yeah. First of all, I couldn't agree with you more. I was a one disease doctor and still am. So, you know, a general uh, oncology exam seems irrelevant to me in my role. And I had the paradox early in my career of literally teaching the board review course in breast cancer and having to sit for the board exam worried that I wouldn't pass because I wouldn't know the answers outside of breast cancer. So I feel everyone's pain. I want to address both of these issues, uh, though, clearly. On the dues front, I understand the the, the reflex, and I'm, uh, I, I just hope the members understand that what we are doing is exactly the way that they would approach um, any issue in their professional lives. If you heard a claim that a new drug was a breakthrough, you would look for the data before you implemented it. And if the data was a few anecdotes from a phase one trial, you'd be looking for a study to put your patient on and to help generate the real answer. And then you'd be looking for guidelines, whether ours or NCCN, to adopt it, to confirm that your impression was right. We're in the middle of that exact parallel process right now. We heard the claim that there's a 
problem. We now have the evidence that there's a problem. And what we're about to do is to dive in further. For example, in our survey, there was a disproportionate response from academia, interestingly enough. And we think that it's really important that the community voice be heard. So we're conducting this month a series of interviews into specifically how private practice oncologists view this MOC program and what they would like to see in a potential alternative. We have a, an MOC task force. It's using the survey and then the interview uh, findings to develop alternative proposals to take to ABIM. And our plan, um, supported by the members' dues, is to go to ABIM in 2024 with concrete proposals for a better um, approach to MOC and and uh, and lifelong learning in the future. And if may, may I, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I just want to offer one thing. That's it's the framing is going to be important as you go through this. And I'm just going to give you an example. It's um, so if you tell me that this is this is an issue that I must deal with, but let's try to figure out how to make it better is one way versus is this something you think you should be dealing with? Like if you come to me and say, look, the MOC is not gonna go away. You must figure, we, you must take these tests. I'm gonna work with you to see which is the better test, the process, all of these things. Then in my mind, I'm thinking the problem now is no longer the MOC or the test. The problem is, are there better ways to do it? So the process becomes the problem. But if you ask me the question and say, Shadi, do you think you should have MOC and continue to take the exam? Yes or no? Then my mind is thinking, well, you know, my answer could be no, then there's no problem at all. So how you frame the question to the community oncologist, I do think is going to be important because I if agree. you go to them, yeah, if you go to them and say, look, I'm just going to work with you on making the MOC process better, in their mind, they're thinking, well, the MOC is there. I'll work with ASCO to make it better. Versus, I think you should ask them before, if I may, do you think you should have an MOC or not? I, I think that um, I would even go up even a level beyond that. We all take an oath. Right. And one of the issues that we're thinking a lot about for the next 15, 25 years is what it means to be a professional. What is professionalism? How do we maintain the professionalism that we grew up on into a future with artificial intelligence and bots and automation of all kinds? Um, how do we make sure that it is attractive and rewarding to serve patients as um, physicians and specifically as oncologists? And I think the question you're asking, which for me rises even higher, which is, how do we productively engage in meaningful lifelong learning? That's the only question. I don't care if we call it MOC. I don't know if it involves regular testing in a formal structure or frankly, a question a day on your iPhone with no time limit. I don't know what is required in order to make, in order to be confident that we're all expanding our minds, increasing our knowledge and our awareness of what's out there. To your earlier point about the change in learning and the change in resources, that's true, but you have to be curious. You have to know that there are things to look for in order to find them. Absolutely. So it isn't right. So 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 I I I take your question as spot on and I hope nobody is confused by the fact that we want to work with them to create a better future to mean that we are implying that any aspect of the current program is effective or evidence-based or useful. That's not the point. The point is how do we support our community in maintaining the lifelong learning that best serves our patients? That's the whole question. What, what's your answer to the, I don't want to call it threats, but I do see it on social media. I'm not going to renew. I'm not going to pay, you know, blah, 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 all of these things. I know you can't force people to pay, obviously, but, you know, I think the economic, the sense is that the economic yeah. pressure might lead to change. I, I don't know what more change folks could really want. I mean, what we are doing, and I hope what, you know, people hear from this is that we have been 
productively engaged and we intend to be productively engaged. Um, ASCO, of course, is not a certifying body. And that's a very purposeful choice. Um, so on behalf of our members, we're going to advocate for what is the most appropriate way to assure people of easy access to lifelong learning. And um, we, we touched on this before, but I'll point out again that while the ABIM frequently now falls back on the we're the test taking group and you guys are the education group, the truth is that 2020 task force that I mentioned earlier spoke about lifelong learning as one of the um, requirements. So I think there's an opportunity to collaborate and allow them to maintain their role as a certifying body for our field. Um, but I think there's got to be ways to do it that are, frankly, not just more acceptable, but downright pleasant and pleasurable and rewarding for our members. That's the future we're building. Uh, you know, I'm going to suggest there's no conflict of interest. You can make listening to healthcare unfiltered. You get five <laughs> MOC points. There you go. <laughs> uh, you've been very <laughs> no generous. conflict at all, right? <laughs> Very generous with your time, Cliff. Really appreciate it. But maybe we, we can finish off with, uh, A, is there anything else I should have asked you about everything I completely missed? And B, what are the next steps just for listeners to know? And what, what should they expect from ASCO over the next few months? Several things. First of all, I want to make sure people know that we are deeply engaged in this. And again, I like the parallel to the way we develop new treatments. We are in the middle of the research phase and we intend to make concrete proposals for a better future. Number two, we can't do this without deep engagement from everybody. So A, if you get a survey request from us, please respond. B, if you heard about a survey and don't get the request in your email, reach out to us. Um, I, a few people did that with me personally and we made sure that we were getting through their spam filters and firewalls and everything else. It's just the problem of the modern day. Uh, the third thing is um, let us know what you think. Uh, I mean, I frankly am delighted to get direct email from people. Uh, I will acknowledge it all and I will pass it all on to our MOC task force. And uh, then um, I would ask folks to just hang on uh, in the spring uh, or certainly early in 2024, our concrete plan is to engage with ABIM in discussions about upgrades to the system to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, uh, we appreciate all of the efforts. I, I think it's, uh, uh, we understand that uh, you're doing everything you can to help things uh, get better. There's the school of thought that this problem should never even be a problem. We should just have the lifelong certification. You know, folks uh, who are board sir, who are practicing in Germany, England, France, they don't do that. They clearly not inferior doctors to us. Um, uh, there's a lot of people who say that this was a created problem to generate revenue to the ABIM, um, because in a sense that you know. I have to research this, but my understanding, we're the only country that does that. Uh, I believe that in pretty much other thing, other countries, they don't do have that. And, and also professionally, uh, I realize we obviously deal with people's lives. So I understand that the differences between a financial advisor and a lawyer, as opposed to a doctor. So I, I think the parallel uh, that in other certifications, um, folks don't really um, take an exam as well. But uh, these are the things you hear uh, as you develop the surveys, as you talk to folks. I'm pretty sure you're staying attuned to what you see uh, anecdotally from social media and others. And um, we just look forward to um, to next steps. I, uh, I'm i from the camp in, in all fairness where I, I don't know what the right answer, but I kind of feel if I have a lot of CME points, I go to the conferences, I have my peers will tell me if I'm messing up, I'm licensed in five states. It's it's hard for me to believe that taking these tests are going to make me a better doctor, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I will share with everybody that I have had, um, before I say that, let me say, I think it's important, especially in this era, to learn how to agreeably disagree. We have to be able to talk with people whose opinions we don't agree with and do it in a way that is um, doesn't make it impossible 
to work together. So in that regard, I'm not violating any confidence. I will just say I've had prolonged discussions personally uh, with leadership at ABIM, and I have conveyed serious misgivings, concerns, and cautions. And to their credit, while they um, have not initially agreed with most of what I had to say, they have also been very good at listening. They have, where possible, provided evidence for different points of view. And I am optimistic that we can collaboratively work together and create a um, future state that will do several things. Number one, not be the burden it, need, it has been on our members. Number two, provide the general public with the reassurance that their doctors really are up to date and delivering high quality care. And number three, be a constructive part of lifelong learning to which we're all committed. Well, this is a perfect way to end the podcast. But of course, I got to take a picture because I have to put it on Twitter. So now you get smart to the camera. You know, it's very, it's on my iPhone. That's what it is. Why don't you just do a screenshot? Like I a, don't know how to do it. That's the funny part. What Honestly, kind of computer are you on? It's a, it's a Mac Pro book. Perfect. So now you hit the control button, the command button, and number four at the same time. And you'll get a little cursor. Control, command, Four. Shift control and number four, sorry. Ah, shift control. And number four, all at once. No, it's not working. Yeah, 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 yeah. Try again. Okay. Hit well... the shift button and then the control button and then the command button and then number four all at once. Ah, I fo ah now and I now drag it. that over as much of the screen as you want to capture. Oh, look at it. You know, I'm being, I'm learning this live, folks, on healthcare unfiltered. Okay, and then where's the picture go? When you do open up another document of any kind, like a Word document, and hit Control Command V, and it'll paste there. Okay, uh, I mean for uh, folks who hit Command V, and it's gonna. Okay, I actually learned something live on healthcare unfiltered. <laughs> Right. And and I wish I could give you some MOC points for this. Hey, you never know. I'm just thinking, just, just I'm throwing this out there. Cliff, this was really a pleasure to have you on. I really appreciate it. And I know that you have a, a, a lot of uh, stress schedule. I also know that um, you could have gone on so many podcasts and outlets to, to give this. So I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to share this with a lot of viewers and listeners. Thanks very much. I, Jen, I just want to remind everybody, this is a work in progress and we are optimistic about what lies ahead. I would just ask people to stay in touch and watch for our communications on this. There's more coming. Look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you so much, Cliff.